Hi, I'm Sean Duggan, and welcome to another episode of The Fix, the podcast about Photoshop, Lightroom, post-processing, and the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. In this episode, we're going to add a little texture to the show, talking about adding textures to your images with photographer, author, workshop leader, and Nikon legend behind the lens, Tony Sweet. Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in as always. I do appreciate that. So I'm really looking forward to this episode because I get to sit down with uh, Tony Sweet, whom I've never met, but who I have uh, a fair amount in common with. Uh, things such as Iceland and magic and things like that. How are you doing, Tony? I'm doing great, Sean. How are you? I'm also a huge fan of your work uh, yeah, and have been for a while, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very much. Now, you're based out in uh, Maryland, is that right? We are in central Maryland. It's horse country, although they're building it up. Everybody's moving up here, but it was nice for a while. But it's still yeah. a nice place. It's, it, it's a good place to be. It's not too crowded and uh, in close proximity to uh, major areas to do stuff, so it's good. Is it is it cold out there in December here this time of year? I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, not right now. We haven't had a cold winter here. Well, it kind of goes every two or three years. It's going to be, I think, a, a warm one this year. Yeah. But uh, there's climate. I mean, there's no doubt that the that the global climate is changing. There used to be. We used to have like two major snowstorms a year when I was a kid. That isn't that long ago. Yeah. And now we have like one every two or three years. So the weather's changed uh, from where we are dramatically in the last. Uh, oh yeah. Week. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Same, same thing for me out here in the uh, in the Sierras in California. Same same deal. So anyway, in terms of of our uh, our, our points of, of common interest, uh, one of those is is Iceland, where both of us lead uh, photography workshops with a focus on nature. And I know you've got uh, two workshops coming up uh, scheduled this year. Right? Is that right? Well, they're scheduled. You know how that goes. They are scheduled. We have enough interest on each one, but we'll see how the uh, how it goes when it comes time to to sign on. But so far, we have two scheduled, and it could be uh, it could be a good year. We'll see. And that's in uh, in the summer, and then also in the fall. Yes, exactly. In June and September. Yeah, yeah. That's those are both great times because I was in the fall there there last year. Uh, beautiful time to be there, and of course, then you have the the ability to. Uh, hopefully see the auroras if they decide to show up in the fall, which we don't, don't get recall, the you, I'm sorry. As I recall, you did very well with that when you were there. Your stuff was just killer that you put up. It's just amazing. Thank you. Yeah, well, we, we had we had good luck in the fall, but then the, the winter workshop that I did last March, uh, that was, you know, really good. It was definitely a couple of nights of really good auroras then, including a, a level nine, which is like the, the highest it goes on the on the scale of, of the probability that you'll see auroras. So yeah, good for you. That was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. So I, I actually have a, a winter landscapes and auroras workshop coming up in March, just in a few months. So looking forward to yeah, good, good for you to that as well. And then the, the magic thing that we have uh, in common, that, that's kind of interesting just because uh, in addition to being a, a photographer and an author workshop leader, Nikon legend behind the lens. You also have uh, been a professional jazz musician. Is that that correct? Oh, I still play, just not for my uh, my mortgage anymore. Mortgage, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, play for the love of it. I'm sure you'll always be playing for the love of it. That's right. That's right. And then also, you you've uh, been a magician before and worked with magicians. Is that correct? Yes, I actually um, toured with Blackstone as a drummer and uh, worked as a close up. Uh, sleight of hand artist for uh, quite a few years, actually. Yeah, that's that that's pretty interesting. Yeah, as as I mentioned to you before before the show, I worked with uh, some magicians and illusionists when I lived in Southwest Idaho. This was back in the nineteen eighties, and you know, uh, a, a couple of times that was back in my youth when I was a much more svelte person. I I was actually an on stage assistant uh, a couple of times, but uh, also helped in the staging of you know big illusion shows. So that was kind of a uh, a fun thing to do. Oh, it's yeah. always great. Did you have to sign a, a non-disclosure agreement with this? Is, is the state props? <laughs> yes, yes. You have to like keep keep the secrets until you die. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> I signed that too. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in terms of your uh, your photography workshops, you know, I am always amazed at how 
um, how often you're out traveling and doing workshops, you and, and Sue. And, and so I go to your website and I see you've got this great list of locations all around the U S and then, you know, of course, occasionally in Iceland. So are, how often are you, are you out on the road doing a workshop? Uh, a little more than we'd like to be at this stage of the game, but uh, we're trying to tailor back a little bit in the coming years, but uh, you wouldn't tell about the schedule, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, we're probably gone as far as like straight time goes, maybe like, uh, I don't know, Sean, six, six months a year, maybe a little bit less. It seems like it's more, but it, it, you know, like out for a month and then back for a few weeks, out for a week, back for two weeks. So it's, it, it's, it, it feels like we're gone a lot, but we're actually not as long. Right. As think right. We, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As it feels like, you know? Yeah. And then you, you, in addition to the workshops, you also offer, um, you know, private, uh, training and online training, things like that. Well, we're all doing the same thing. Yeah, you know, people uh, hire me to go out and work with them personally or small groups and uh, more private tutoring. So online critiquing stuff that we have, yeah. <clears throat> different services like that. But in general, it's just it's all education based. What we do. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I know you said that you were uh, a professional m m uh, musician. I was going to say magician. I, I, know, I know. Yes. I know you've been about, but a professional musician for about 20 years. Uh, when did you get into photography? When did you pick up a camera and start grooving on that riff? Oh, about 20, 25 years ago. You know, this yeah. seems like a long time and it is. God, when I think back, you know, but uh, yeah, I just um, went on the road and decided to take a camera. Didn't know what I was doing. So I, I, you know, I, I got a friend of mine to show me how camera worked and took one yeah. out on the road and then kind of got hooked on it. And I started going out to take pictures and then decided that I wanted to do this as the uh, music business changed. I've never been one to like it, get locked into one thing because things always change and your life changes, situations change. I, I always had options, you know, you know, along the line. When I decided to pitch you know, music professionally, I, I kind of, moved into this pretty seamlessly and, and, and picked up where I left off just a different set of tools, you know, yeah. same basic, same basic idea. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, there are some, some similarities, I think, um, uh, although I am not a musician, uh, I have heard musicians in the past who have also been photographers speak to the similarities between, you know, making music as well as making images. And of course, Ansel Adams, you know, was probably, uh, maybe the most famous person to, to first uh, put forth that idea. Do you find that to be the case with your own image making? I see no difference at all, except for the tools. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same mental process. You know, once you can actually, <clears throat> pardon me, once you can actually uh, uh, get the ability, you know, learn how to uh, 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 empty your mind. It's kind of a Zen. I, I don't want to sound too like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, that word kind of conjures up, you know, yeah, yeah, the, the whole new agey kind of thing. It's pop culture thing, but in general, like it, it is a way of thinking and a way of approaching things. Yeah. And and once you free your mind of preconceptions, everything's possible. Ah, there's a good there's a good pull quote there. <laughs> <laughs> what you you're free yourself by? I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was gonna say, you know, that no, that's a, that's a great quote there. Uh, you don't limit it. yourself by preconceptions. That's what they do by definition. You know. Yeah, and when you get rid of those things. You, you see things much clearer and with much more open mind. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've run into that myself, where I've gone in out and um, you know <laughs> to make a photograph, and I had a very preconceived idea of the photograph that I wanted to make that day. Not and always bad, by the way. Not always bad. No, no, it's not always bad, but 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 sometimes it can stifle you because, especially if that photograph isn't happening. <laughs> you know, it's just not coming together for you know, whatever circumstances, then kind of uh, clinging too tightly to that preconceived idea of, of the photograph you want to make sort of closes off the possibilities or, or maybe you, you seeing the other possibilities that might be there. I've definitely run into that. No, it's funny you mentioned that when I first, I, I wrote for Shutter Vlog magazine years ago. And uh, when I first started doing this, I, I realized that, you know, I'd be driving somewhere at destination base I'd be like, wow, look at that fog. I keep driving, you know, look at that great tree, keep driving. And when I got to where I was going, it, 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 it was terrible. So I thought, <laughs> you know, you're like, you know what? There's shots on the way to the shot, you know, and you can't really pass those up. So yeah. I don't anymore. Yeah. You know, I just stop and it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm going somewhere. Well, you know, whenever I go on a, a road trip or something like that, uh, or, or even just, you know, let's say I'm going to go visit somebody and it's normally a three hour drive to go get to this person's place, you know, 
if I have the ability in my schedule, you know, I always tell them, you know, well, I'll probably be there, you know, in, in six or seven hours and they'll go, well, but it's only about a three hour drive. I say, yeah, I know, but I'm a photographer. <laughs> I'm exactly. Gonna, exactly. I'm going to yeah. stop, you know? Yep. Exactly. You can't, you can't drive past shots. I mean, there, there's no guarantee where you're going, going to be any better. Yeah. Just because yeah. you're going there. <laughs> And, and, you know, the, 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 the thing that always kills me sometimes is that if I'm actually on a schedule and I definitely have to be someplace at a certain time and I pass something, it's like, oh, damn, I really wish I could stop. And you take never that forget picture. those shots, do you? you? You really forget those. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a little after image that's always haunting you. Like, oh, God, that would have been a great shot. That's right. I have to get them all the time. It drives me crazy. I know. I know. Or, or the other thing that, that really kills me is that sometimes you're driving, you know, on the road um and you see something and it's perfect but then by the time you it's safe to get off and stop maybe you're on a freeway or whatever and you try to backtrack to where it was that you saw that you're never quite in the exact same position as you were in the car <laughs> where the angle was perfect and you know that's right that's right john Schall, yeah john Shaw says shoot it when you see it so if you drive 50 yards past it that's not where you saw it no i know i know and sometimes you just you just can't do that can't you can't do, do that yeah <laughs> So, you know, I really love um, the way that you use texture uh, a, a lot in your images. And I've always, you oh, know, you. Ad admired that. There's just a, a real subtle way that you use the texture and, and also the way you blend in, in color and stuff like that. Uh, do you find that in addition to uh, um, how, you know, kind of music can, your music background can influence maybe your photography, do you find that... Um, qualities such as improvisation also creep into the post-processing stage when you're working with things like texture? Oh, it doesn't creep in at all. It's just there. It's just there. Yeah. From just, uh, 20 years of doing it pretty much for a living. You know, yeah. It's the way you train your mind. It's the way that you've got to train your mind to think or to actually not think when you improvise because you can't think as fast as you can react. Yeah. Any kind of uh, improvisatory situation is, is, is you're reacting. Yeah. Trained, you know, it's just trained reacting. Like you yeah, train yourself yeah. to, to not think and to react. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy, but that's kind of what it is. Right, right. And, and so when you're working with, uh, with textures, and, you know, we're going to get into a, a, a demo section here where you're going to show some stuff in a little bit. But when you're working with textures, do you um, find yourself, uh, you know, coming to a point where you go, oh, I really like that. So I want to kind of keep a copy of that and maybe go in another direction, follow the improvisation a little bit further. Um, and how do you handle that in Photoshop? Do you, do you save out a separate file? Do you take, um, you know, make a, a merged layer of the way it looks at a certain point in time? I, I don't do that a lot because I tend to um, like to, uh, to not reproduce things exactly. Or uh, you know, again, it, it, it's the uh, you know, jazz musician I don't want to say training, but it's just a way of thinking, you know, I'd rather reinvent the same thing over and over again mm -hmm. and start fresh. Cause it's all going to be different. Right. Might be better and it might be worse. That's the chance that you take. Yeah. You know? But I'm not one to really like, you know, save a lot of versions of something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll just start over. <laughs> True. Yeah. And it, every time it's a different, it, it's a different thing. It's a different, it's almost like a new performance piece. You know, you just sort of like, it's a totally that's different the way, thing. That's the way I see it. Yeah. You know what I like to do sometimes is I like to do what, what I like to call Photoshop road trips. And for me, a Photoshop road trip is where I just kind of sit down at the computer, open up Photoshop, start playing with a couple of images with no agenda in mind. It's just kind of like, and the road trip metaphor is that, okay, I'm just going to go on a road trip and just sort of get in the car and drive. And so that's my... Think about it, man. It's exactly, that's exactly right. I do, yeah. the, I do the same thing as you do. I'll, I'll just sit around and I'm not sure what happens. It's just something that just kind of takes over for a few seconds. And I'm going through files, you know, and it's like uh, that one. And yeah. then you just start. I mean, it's just yeah. crazy. I have no preconception. I, I didn't want to, I have no idea where I was going. It's just, let's just try that. And it just comes out of nowhere. And then once that, you know, you know once that, uh, that switch is thrown, then you're into this whole, this whole thing. You know, yeah. but there's no, there's no way to really like, uh, I mean, for me, I'm going to do this image because what if it doesn't move? You know, what if I don't like it after I, you know, it, it's, it's got to be that kind of spontaneity for it to work for me anyway. Yeah. And, and it's, it's kind of mysterious too, and in, into where those ideas come from, you know, because you're working with an image and suddenly 
you know, something will occur to you and you think, oh, well, what if I do this? And then, oh, then that sparks another idea, which leads you down. And, and it's almost like, you know, you're, you're following this sort of little Johnny Appleseed of creative op- uh, inspiration, you know? <laughs> That's exactly what it is, you know? You're going to be able to, you down the path. to do that. Yeah, you have to let yourself do that, you know? And, and pretty much, yeah, again, it's about freeing your mind and, and just, um, just going with stuff and trying to make, you know, you know, one of the things about music, which is great, especially improvised music, <clears throat> you know, a lot of what we do when I played for a living is that everybody's experimenting all the time. So you're in a group dynamic and everybody's on their own separate path, but you're working with in a group framework, you know, so far. So if, um, you know, we'll try things and someone will turn the beat around, you got to find a way to get back to the right time. So I play a wrong change. And, and, and the true challenge is, is to make things that, that aren't right, make them right. Uh-huh. You know, that's, that's the game, you know, it happens a lot, you know, and, and the more facile you are with, with your instrument and the more facile you are with various software plugins and Photoshop knowledges you have, you know, you can find, yeah. you can find a way of almost anything. Just, yeah. find, just find your way out. If you have the knowledge, the requisite knowledge. Yeah. Be able to do that, you know. Yeah, you have to know, you have to know the basic, um, I like to call them the dance steps, you know, the, the Photoshop dance steps or the, the basic dance steps of whatever software you happen to be using, you know, Couldn't agree more. in order to, to improvise. You know, when I was, I was, I was telling one of my classes once that, you know, well, you know, learning, learning Photoshop is a little bit like dancing, learning how to dance because several years ago, my wife and I took a ballroom dance class and, you know, the first several weeks, I don't know. I mean, I was kind of like, you know, two left feet and always, you know, stepping on her toes. And, you know, she had a lot more grace and natural talent at it than I did. And and there came a point where, I don't know how, how many weeks later, you know, we've been doing this practicing, you know, every week. And we were practicing a dance before kind of the actual uh, instructed part of the, of the course, uh, the session began. Can't even remember what dance it was, whether it was a foxtrot or a tango or whatever, or waltz, but it got to the point where suddenly we're, we're dancing and I suddenly realized, oh my God, we're dancing. And I don't have to like be thinking of those little step diagrams in my head and thinking ahead, well, my foot goes here next. It just was coming and it was flowing naturally. And, you know, learning anything uh, it, it's kind of like that, whether it's cooking or music or, you know, Photoshop, it, that's, you get to a point where it just sort of comes naturally. There's no question about it. You know, once, once all the parts, once all the parts are in place, then it's like getting them all like to get the gears to all mesh and then you're good to go. I, I found that with music, with magic, with almost anything. It's like, okay, it, it, this is good. I got this now, you know, it's just all of a sudden after like, you know, years of like, you know, working and working and like working on one thing is finally, okay, now it's easy. Yeah. yeah it's not it's all come... of a sudden either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It seems that way, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. There, there definitely comes a, a time and, and, you know, this can be applied to anything, like I said, uh, where it does, it becomes second nature and you can just sort of get in the car and drive and, and just sort of see where the road takes you. You need the upfront work. No question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of the road, uh, I know that you have some uh, some examples maybe to show us about how you you like to use textures. Is is that the case? Well, I've got one key up here that um, I got some some notes on that I could uh, probably deviate from. I'm sure. Okay, I'll, I'll kind of pull this up and uh, and show you what I do basically on, on these uh, texturizing uh, images. Great, great. Well, why don't you start sharing your screen? And let's get into that. You know, I've always found texturizing to be a um, pretty cool way to make your work unique. It's a pretty cool thing to do. I've liked it for years and haven't gotten good at it till about three, four years ago. It is kind of an attitude and it's also a function of software and uh, uh, getting your vision to mature a little bit. So you start seeing these things in more abstract ways. <clears throat> Pardon me. So what I do look you, for, um... I'm sorry. Well, just just a quick question, uh, you know, in, in addition, of course, to, you know, photographing textures that you run across, you know, whether it's, you know, old peeling paint or rusted metal or something like that. Do you have uh, any other kind of sources for uh, textures like out on the web that you like to use? Well, sure. I uh, shoot my own and I use primarily uh, fly paper textures. They're very uh, they have a lot of texture sets. They're all very well crafted. Yeah. They, have this, they have the same visual type sonority from each set. So there's no, there's no jarring difference from one set to another. And they're very well done. 
and I shoot my own like, like all of us do. Yeah, um, of course. But mostly fly paper and, and my own. And I'll pick up ones from friends here. If it's a, but mostly just uh, fly paper and, and mine. The thing about using a, a textures like that is that, you know, they're pre-made, but when you stack one on the other and do some masking and all that stuff, it, it changes radically. They become your own after a certain point. Yeah. I tend to want to look for images that are, have some negative space to give the texture some meaning, you know? So this, this image here of a uh, lone tree, one of my favorite uh, locations on the East Coast, it's called, it's on Botany Bay, outside of Charleston. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, it's got these tree snags in the water, and of course their, their lifespans are limited because they are dead trees in salt water. There's no root system, so whenever there's a storm, I'm, I'm worried that they're gonna go away, but so far they're still there. The cool thing about this is that you can separate them, get like one single tree like this with a real nice dawn sky and, and do a, a long exposure to get the water very smooth. It gets a very, uh, 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 what's the word I want with clouds? I tend to like clouds that are, are sparse and not dense. Yeah. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, more ethereal. Yeah. A small number of clouds moving over a series of minutes. And that's what this is very small patch of clouds for like four minutes going through the frame, <clears throat> which gives us the uh, raw material to uh, drop on our textures. There are many ways uh, to apply textures. You can do it uh, manually. On well, something like this, I would tend to, um, uh, there's several texture sets you could use, several ways to apply them. Um, the one that I use a lot is, is Russell Brown's. It's the, um, the Adobe Texture Panel, I believe it's called. Let's go to the, um, See, where is it? It's in extensions. Yeah. The Adobe Paper Texture Pro. It's a panel. Right. And this here, you install it. Or it installs itself. I'm not sure how it gets in there. I forgot. But you download it from Russell's website. The only caveat is that you would need to be a member of the cloud. Uh, if not, there are other ways. There's one that's um, by Totally Rad called Dirty Pictures. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah, which, which is great. It's a great name. But it costs, I think, a hundred bucks or more, and the uh, the Russell Brown panel is free. Right, because Russell's a very generous, uh, a genius, and a very great guy. So he's he's a good buddy, good friend. Yeah, not a good friend. I'll but a good uh, guy. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to where people can uh, find that Adobe Pay for Textures Pro panel. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's helped me with uh, drones and little questions that I've asked him. He's been very helpful in things that I needed help with. So he's a very uh, very good guy. So, and it appears here, and I click on this. Now, what I would normally do, you can pick different uh, texture sets. I can go in here and say, uh, this is a particular set of flypaper. I can say, add more. What it does not do, it does not add to what you have. It just replaces what you have. So, if I say, add more, I can go in here and select a folder and pick one of these, which will replace this. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, but I like this uh, this set right here, which I use most of the time, actually. So, uh, as you can see, there's three that I've got checked. Let's start again. What I'll normally do is I'll just go through and look at the picture, look at the color scheme, the graphic, where the texture, you know, the way that the, that the texture is, is uh, distributed throughout the, uh, the texture uh, itself. And I'm probably going to go with... I think I had these three marks. I've played around with them. This light one will be uh, a pretty much won't affect the color a lot. And what I pick here is, is you have the, uh, the blend modes. That means that what, whatever you pick in this panel comes into your layers palette at that particular blend mode. It means that that's how you first see it. After which, which we'll do in a second, we go and we can change it here again. So they all come in in multiply mode. And then I'll change that as we go. And I like this texture here, the one under it, which is kind of nice. A little more brush, a little more grunge, and then the golden brush strokes down here. Here we go. Here's our, now it looks crazy. It looks crazy. So this is raw material. All these are are raw material. What I will do now, I generally pick three and wind up using two. That's my basic pattern. I pick three and then wind up with two. Most of the time, I'll just turn these off and crack them on one at a time. So we'll have a look at this one. And that's not bad. I'll keep that as is. 
Let's look up here. That is a bit much. So the first thing I'll do is play with the blend modes and lighten it up, either here or down here. Okay, soft light maintains the texture, but it brightens it up a lot, which is nice. And what I like, I can make it a bit smaller so I can paint here. What I like is the grunge feel in the water, but it's a bit too much in the sky. This is where mm -hmm. we click on the mask in the layers palette, and then make sure we have the black over here. Flip the, uh, whatever that's called, the left-hand side there. What's that called, Sean? Where the, the, uh, the um, are... exchange? Yeah, the just tool exchange. panel? Foreground and background. You want the uh, black oh, yeah. in the foreground. Then we get B for brush, and use your bracket mode to increase it a bit. We're going to paint or brush that texture out of the sky, not at a high opacity, a moderate opacity. You want to maintain some of the texture, but not all of it. We'll pull the opacity back at the very top, maybe like 50 or 60%, pull the flow rate back so it brushes, uh, it lays the, uh, it, it removes it in, in smaller uh, increments, and a little larger brush with the bracket panel or bracket uh, key, and then we'll brush the effect out. If you look on the right-hand side, you'll see in the layers palette where we're brushing the effect out but not at 100%, and not over the so entire the, the nice, Please, go ahead. Yeah, so the nice thing about the, um, the Adobe Paper Texture Pro panel is that when it adds the texture, it also brings in a layer mask for the texture, so that's already in place for you. That is, that, yeah, cool. that, that's, yeah, exactly. You get the same thing with uh, Dirty Pictures, a little different, but the same basic idea. They're, they're both very good. So I'm going to brush the... Um, the texture out of here and a little soft light blend mode. So already we, we've added texture, but toned it back a little bit. And then the last one with the heavy brush strokes is the third one. And at this point, uh, let's bring it back down to, uh, you know, again, if it's, if it's too dark, you have the options to pull the opacity back in the layers palette, but then you lose, you lose the, um, the hard edge of the texture, which I kind of like up in here to the left side, you can see it. Looks like mm -hmm. hitting strokes almost. The other option is to change the blend mode. And again, we'll go to soft light, I think. Let me see, let me try that. Yeah, there we go, there we go. Oh, now cool. we have our heavy texture in here. Now we'll pull our opacity back just a little bit. There we go, to tone it down and Let's see, at this point, let's go to levels, because right now we're kind of in the ballpark. If we hold down the option key, hit the bottom eyeball in the layers palette, you have the before, which is fine. It's a completely different interpretation. And then we're up here with this. At this point, I'm going to do a claw. You guys know what a claw is? A claw? It's shift, option, command, or shift, alt, oh. command. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, it's got a weird name. It gives you a layer. It collapses. It flattens all the layers below it and puts it in a separate layer. At this point, I can go in and do a levels. Uh, don't tell me here. There we go. Adjustment layer. And then we'll bring that up a notch and play with the midtones a bit. Something like here. So right now you're doing an adjustment layer that's affecting the entire image. That's right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so another approach that I've used sometimes, like if I find that a certain blend mode is a little bit too dark, I mean, I like it, but it's a little bit too dark is I'll add a, a clipped adjustment layer to just the texture. And then I'll modify the brightness of the texture so that it starts working better with the blend mode that I'm interested in. Okay. I don't know that. <laughs> I'd love to learn that. <laughs> So like right, like right now, where you're at now, you've yes. got that levels layer on top of the, of the texture or on top yes. of the layer. But like if you click on the, the clipping icon in the properties panel where the histogram is, the first icon down in the, or, or you can, you know, option click between the layers, of course, it'll uh, have it affect just the, that layer below it. And so I, I use that sometimes to modify textures. Oh, man, that's good. And yeah, I like that. I'm going to learn it. So now we're about here. That's looking really nice. 
It's it's not bad. It, it it's doesn't have quite the color that I want in here. So let's um let's do a couple things. Uh, let me introduce um, <clears throat> the Atoni Kuiper luminosity masks. I'm sure you know what they are. Yeah. The Kuiper mask. Yeah. Uh, that's highly recommended. I'm going to change workspaces for that. Go to my luminosity workspace, and then I'll pick the pen. I do recommend this highly. It's inexpensive and it's a great tool for you guys out there. And I'm going to pick my dark one of my dark areas which will bring in the right hand bottom and the tree trunk which is almost black uh -huh. so that is selected and then i'll just go to curves it gives you a curve adjustment layer immediately and double click on that and then we'll brighten that up pull the just max it out pin it to the very top and now we hit the the before and after at the bottom here we have before and I have to really soften that hard edge a bit. Makes more sense blending wise to me mm -hmm. at this point. Now we can add a hue saturation. We're almost getting there. We'll do a hue saturation adjustment layer. So layers and then uh, hue saturation. And it comes in, in in master. Doesn't matter what color you pick. Just get to any color. Say I pick green. Doesn't matter. It gives you access to these eyedroppers here. I'll pick the midtone eyedropper and click on a color somewhere, say somewhere around here at the bottom, to the left of the tree where the, uh, there's some sunrise, dawn, sky color. Yeah, right. Click here and then pull the saturation up a little bit, see what we get somewhere in there. That's global. It does warm everything up, but it's kind of an abstract image. Be about. Yeah, no, it's, it looks nice for that image though. Maybe about here. And we're pretty much, we're pretty, pretty much in the ballpark here, Sean. Let's do one more thing. Let me go up to, um, see, can I do it from here? No. Let me do a, a claw again. That's shift, option, alt, and command, letter E. I think, yeah, I think it's a command, shift, or excuse me, command, option, shift, E, I think. That's what it is. What did I say? That's what I thought. Of. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah. But I, I love calling it the claw. I had, actually hadn't heard that, but it, it is a, a good uh, description of what your hand has to do. Let's go up here and see if we can do that. If you do it with one hand, it, it actually is a claw. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, with one hand. <laughs> <That's>, <clears throat> pardon me. So what I want to do is add some structure. So I'm going to go into um, Nick, go into Viveza, which has a structure slider easy to get to and i'm going to push that up then i'm going to basically pick the uh i'm going to brush it in so I select brush and then wherever i brush that it intensifies the structure so i'm going to make it a bit smaller and i want to accentuate the horizon line a bit and so what what the nick software is doing there is it uh, when you take the image into Nick to apply the structure, it returns the effect as a new layer in Photoshop, correct? With a mask. That, it does indeed. I'm looking at it right now. That's right. Yeah. And then we increase the horizon line, accentuate that to separate um, the sky from the, to give it a, 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 a demarcation point, so to speak. And, and I think we're pretty much, that's pretty much the, uh, the journey, Sean. I mean, after, like after this point, I'll add one more claw layer. I got to okay Nick out, sorry. Let me apply Nick, then we'll do one more claw. I got to do a lot of claws. <laughs> one more here. Well, it, it is the season for Santa Claus after all, so the, the fact that you're doing a claw is appropriate. It's very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me do, I can't get it to, to show up here. Is that weird? What I would do is do one more claw and then uh, just do some cloning, but I can just do that here. The final step, because textures come in with certain like little marks and little nicks on them, you know, and, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And I will tend to go in after the fact. There it is. And use the, uh, I don't even know what tools are called. It's the um, spot healing brush. Mm -hmm. And then I would go in on a separate layer and clone out these little specks that I don't think are germane to the, uh, the image itself. 
just to clean up like right the the, yeah the the, the 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 little spots and things that they end up being just a little bit more distracting so yeah, yeah exactly and, and all textures have them and, and some images they work and some they don't but in general uh I, I tend to want to clean those up make the image more direct you know um a little cleaner and that's uh, let me go full screen here that's the basic idea sean i mean that, that's pretty much that's pretty yeah, much that's it. Nice. So, so so let me ask you a question you know you kind of uh brought up an interesting point earlier uh that this image was you know fairly minimalist in terms of you know the detail in the image um and so what i wanted to ask you was do you find that since with textures especially if you're kind of layering multiple textures to create the effect uh you're you're adding sort of this new textural detail into the picture do you find that that uh, images with uh not a lot of real intricate image detail actually work lend themselves better to being texturized in this way uh for what i like yeah yeah Here's some example, just real quick, I pulled off some just to show you unprocessed. Uh, here's some other examples of things that I would texturize, something like this. Oh, beautiful. Or thank you, or something like this, a little busier, uh, but again, you have a nice negative space in the background. Um, something like that, very minimalist, right. you know, very light, something like that, a lot of uh, soft mm -hmm. negative space, a lot of bokeh. These, these are like fog. Is great for text. So these are things that I'll probably texturize later today if I get time. But um, it's the same basic idea as this. So yeah, again, no, I like that concept of of you know kind of working with the the more minimalist images, or as you say, the images that have a lot of uh, you know good negative space in them, because in a way the texture becomes this new uh, compositional element that you're working with in a way, and and so having a sort of a, a stage or a place where that texture can go and not compete too much with other uh, details in the image is an important concept. Yeah, it winds up sharing the, uh, the uh, subject uh, platform with the subject, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, very cool. No, that, I really like the way that image turned out. That's, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's quite excellent. So again, real quick, here's hold down option or alt in PC land. And the very bottom eyeball to the right, click on the bottom one, all off, and all on. So it shows you. It, it's neither better nor worse, in my opinion, just another interpretation of it. I mean, I like the original a lot. I like this too. So there's more than one way to yeah. uh, make something work, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's different. No, no, those are great, great tips. And, and so the, um, the Tony uh, Kuiper, the, 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 is that a, a panel that you can purchase or actions it, or how does that it, work? Luminosity mask is it's uh, you would search on Tony Kuiper actions. Uh -huh. I think it's like 79 bucks for this incredible set of actions. And, uh, you know, Sean Bagshaw, somebody who's not a slouch either, very great photographer also, does all the videos on that. Uh -huh. And um, it's extremely useful, targeted adjustments based on luminosity values rather than just on, you know, you can't, you can't select what the software can find mm -hmm. based on luminosity values, you know, so it's very precise at that. And um, I use it a lot. It's a very valuable tool. Cool. Hey, interesting. Well, I'll, I'll put a note for, for that in the show notes as well. Great. 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 Well, that was really cool. Thank you uh, for sharing that. I, I picked up a few cool tricks and I'm glad I learned about those, uh, those masking actions that you, you showed me. That was pretty cool. Oh, they're pretty great, man. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 they're excellent. Cool. So, you know, uh, I know that um, l like me, you are a, an avid iPhoneographer and um, texturing is, is frequently a, a part of the, the edits we apply to our images in apps on the phone, you know, whether it's an iPhone or, or another smartphone. Um, do you have any recommendations for some of your favorite apps for the iPhone that uh, are particularly good at applying textures? Well, I've got to make sure they're still available. The ones that I used to, yeah, they come and they go. Yeah. yeah that's... The, ones I, the ones that I currently use you know, a lot is actually uh, stackables and one called mextures m-e-x-t-u-r-e-s right yeah i've used mextures before you can do multi-layers and it, it, it's really just the way they build it's very um very well done they're both very well done um you know glaze is kind of more of a uh, art you know app um 
I tend to use, like I tend to do what I do here. I tend to use them at very low opacities or brush them in very lightly, you know, if I can, if it's capable to do that. But those are my main, I'm looking right now, those are my main two that I go to. Of course, Snapseed's excellent. It's a go-to app in general. Yeah, that's true. That's where I go first, always. And uh, yeah, an image blender can take a, a heavily textured file with the original file and then just blend in blend modes. It has blend modes like Photoshop does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the nice thing about Image Blender is it's very simple to use, you know. Yeah, uh, one window, just A, B. Two windows, pick your blend mode, and you're good to go. Cool, yeah. That's the, uh, that, that's the two that I use primarily. Um, I think they're extremely good, extremely good for what I want right now. That might right, change yeah. uh, next week. It, it always <laughs> changes with apps, you know. The, I, you know I, either the apps kind of like suddenly disappear from the app store or, you know. Here. You know, what's that, what's that great HDR app that's called? Uh, the uh, your auto stitch. Auto stitch oh, is gone. I know, I know. That's your pan, that's the only panning app I know of. And it's like gone. You gotta do it in Photoshop now until someone else rewrites, you know, I don't know. Uh, there, there's gotta be another good one out there. It's gotta be. If, if, if anybody out there in the listening audience knows a good stitching exactly. app for, for the iPhone. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly, man. Put a <laughs> comment and let us know. So, Tony, where can folks find you out there in Internet land? Uh, my life is on TonySuite.com. I refer that to see what I'm doing. Uh, so do my friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I that's how they, that's how they, that's how they figure out if you like you can come over for dinner. They'd see if you're if you're in town. Right. That's my go to site for me to see what I'm doing. You know, so we all kind of refer to that to see what I'm doing. Yeah, my entire life is on that thing. And, uh, and what, uh, what are your next, uh, upcoming workshops that you have, uh, our, our in? next one is in the smoke. We do a, a winter shootout in the Smokies is primarily photography all day, little class time, but mostly we were out shooting all the venues. Um, winter is great there. It's not crowded. You know, uh -huh. You're li likely to get some nice, uh, your know, hoar frost, some of the areas where the trees all turn white. Oh yeah. We watch the weather for that. That's predictable. We kind of know when that's happening based on the, uh, the, uh, a dew point and that kind of thing. Right. Right. And, uh, the trees are bare, bare trees are, I think very photogenic as an example. I did. I love trees that are bare. They're very graphic. Yeah. And we get a lot of that and uh, the water's flowing cause the ice is beginning to melt a little bit. So it's a good time to be there. And we do that in January, I'm sorry, February. And then we begin our season full tilt in March with, uh, Charleston and, some one day seminars and then we're off to the races, you know, <laughs> <laughs> off to the races. Cool. I know. I know. Yeah, I know you've got a busy schedule, but you get, you know, on, on the upside, you get to go to a lot of really beautiful, cool places to, to do photography. So that's great. And, and we meet great people, which is always the case, you know, I mean, no matter how tired we get, the people are always great. Always, you know, they, they we're, we're there with the same mindset. We're all on the same page. Everybody's yeah, yeah. supportive, you know, it's really a great environment. It's invigorating. Yeah. That's one of the, the, the best things about uh, photography is um you know in those sorts of uh, venues and stuff is just the, the aspect of community and getting together with other photographers and you know people who you know like to do the same things that you do so that that's one of the things i've always enjoyed oh it's fantastic we have people that are like you know they're great photographers who just come because they want to hang out with the group yeah they don't need to be there they want to be there for different reasons you know yeah so it's kind of a nice yeah. uh, it's kind of a nice thing we've been doing it for over 20 years now so we're still we're still in business <laughs> cool, cool great well thanks so much for uh coming on and uh, sharing some of those texturing techniques i do appreciate that well thank you for the great opportunity sean i appreciate it and good talking to you like personally <laughs> yeah i know finally finally it was it was bound to happen that our paths would cross this way and then you know uh one day we'll, we'll actually our paths will cross in in real life and we'll be able to interact with the carbon-based uh Oh my beginning. God, that sounds so unreal. That sounds so unreal, I know. I know. <laughs> Science fiction, man. The future is now. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for tuning in and watching The Fix. Uh, remember that you can always uh, listen to the audio version of The Fix on iTunes. Uh, and you can also find a link to an audio version on the webpage, as well as seeing the video version, thisweekinphoto.com slash the fix uh, i'll be back next week with another episode i'm sean duggan thanks very much for watching see you next time on the fix mm -hmm.